marketplace on the radio where we're yes. they were talking about that living new deal yeah that's cool about the new deal did you listen yeah to that? yeah, yeah. Wait, so living new deal. there's this program at UC Berkeley so where they're like documenting all the um, sites across the country that are that were products of the New Deal funded by WCA, CCC, whatever, you know, New Deal sites. And there's a map, you can go to livingnewdeal.org and there's a map of all the documented sites everywhere. And so I was looking at what ones were in Nashville. Some of my news, like I just went to the park, this is WPA. Yeah, that was really cool. Right, the former main post office in Nashville, you know, this now the Chris Museum. Oh, yeah. Montgomery Dell. Huh? Or, 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 I mean, like, I mean, is that a WPA project? project? I haven't gotten to that one. I started out for yeah. still. So the Iroquois Steeple Chase. Wow. Um, the Natchez Trace yeah. Parkway. Um, yeah. Cockrell yeah. School. Yeah. Several schools. Yeah. West End High School. Right. Hmm. I didn't know any of that. Aiken Elementary School, the Centennial Park Bandstand, which no longer is there, TSU Improvements. Um, this is that Living New Deal Lab. The Centennial Park Art Center. Um, Cheatham Place, Ninth Avenue, public, that was a public housing project. Um, Andrew Jackson Courts, another public housing yeah. project. Gee, um, I don't know any of that. Elizabeth Park Senior Citizen Center on Arthur Avenue. Um, it's a recreation building. It now serves as a senior citizen center. Did you get any fun? The oh. former Pearl High School. Hello. Oh, yeah. Pearl. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the Tennessee Supreme Court. The <laughs> Capitol. Mural, the mural, because they were talking about how they not only funded like building things, but also funded artists to oh, paint yeah. and sculpt and do different kinds of things. We're talking about some mural that's downtown in Los Angeles that was commissioned and paid for. And wow, Eudora Wealthy worked for the WPA as a photographer. Oh, really? There's a lot of artists. Yeah. yeah. County Courthouse mural. Agriculture, <laughs> She was here. Oh, yeah. Hi, Tara Rica. I remember you now. I remember Tara Rica. Hi, everyone. <laughs> the John Sevier State Office Building Mural. There were a bunch of murals in Nashville that were. The Ben West Municipal Building, formerly the City Market. <laughs> I thought it was interesting. I never heard of any of them. Oh, okay. Is Jim Corbin Jennifer the time? Yeah. You ready? You ready. That's ready. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. I think we're past all that. <clears throat> Hank, you were supposed to do that. I said I was going to do it if you weren't here. <laughs> oh, that is I think I said ask Nate. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sue teaches at Belmont. She's been coming here for over two decades. Two decades True. coming here. <laughs> and we're so glad. And we're welcome. Um, thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, okay, so I have two questions to start us off. And the first one is, be honest, how many of you got all the way through part two? Okay, because I don't, I know, because I don't. I don't think we'll get all the way through because this is the most gigantic section. And I was wondering if you really meant to do all no. yeah. You're such so a good student. The end of the book. I know, we're almost to the we end now. Two, two more weeks two after, more. Tonight, after tonight. We'll never get through. But I also didn't want to do a spoiler 
And if you've gotten there, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, for people who haven't gotten that far, we won't get that far. So that was one question. And then the second one is this question about <clears throat> how John Bailey and I find this book. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all are just smarter than No, well, he probably is. Um, do, okay, tell me about your reading. Do you find it, Dana, you're not in love? Tell me why. I don't read books the way you do. Well, but so, you know, somebody will say something, I'm thinking, is there anything besides the obvious they're trying to tell me, you know? Oh, he moved his arms, wonder what that, I, I, I wasn't. Well, that's probably damage that you've incurred by me trying to tell you everything <laughs> or something. Um, but I get what you mean in terms of, you know, this isn't a book with a lot of riveting action, right? That mostly you've got talking and listening. So I do get that. You're not. I'm not in love, no. All right, tell me why. Um, I don't know, it just seems, Maybe I like more action. I don't know. It just seems to be too much in their heads, you know. It's yes. sort of repetitive of the same thing, you know. And it's, and I find some of the characters really annoying. Like like who? Like the um, Jay, the Blount, and that his name, the one, the communist, the communist. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're gonna talk about and him tonight. Seem, you know, and things seem to kind of like, you know, he'll go in and start to do something and then it turns into something else. And I know it's hard to follow what exactly he thinks he's doing. And, you know, like when they go to the house where Willie was and to visit Willie yes. and then he's all of a sudden in there with Dr. Copeland arguing all night, which was like the most boring argument I ever read. Yes. You know? I and, think, yes, <laughs> you're not wrong. And I think in some ways, what she's doing is showing that we are these people, like we're not listening to the people that aren't like us or that we find annoying or find um, exhausting. But I also agree that on some level, all of these people are living in their heads. But that's because it make it through Ulysses either. I've tried like three times. Uh, well, yeah, that's a whole different ball okay. Um, but part of the reason is because they can't effectively communicate with anyone, right? And yeah, so you've got all of this talking at someone that sometimes feels like they're talking at the reader, and you, there's no even real exchange of dialogue with singer and so you're going blah 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 hush yeah. hush hush um and so you're not wrong about any of that now john bailey why why do you still feel that way that I you i don't know i want to clarify i did not say i love the book you, did, you said you couldn't put I it down i could not put it down okay um and I can't remember why. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, even then, I, at the beginning, I wasn't like, oh, I gotta keep reading. Because I haven't read it now for over a week. I've gone ah. working on something else. And so I don't I don't really know what I would feel about it if I pick it when I pick it up. So at the beginning. I, I do have one comment, of course. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I think that as, as I understand it, which I don't understand at all, certainly, but she is dealing with uh, our inability to communicate with each other. And, and, and that's her model for, for living, at least. That, that she's presenting in this book, whether you, whether you agree with that or not, but I think I think that's what she's she's saying. We we don't we don't engage. Yeah, I agree. And, I agree with that. And and she's dealing with that issue primarily. 
But I think, you know, to get your point across, you have to communicate with the reader. Yes, unless that is her point. Maybe. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which you I may not love. Books when you do that. You know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Well, let's see if we can pull some of this apart. Um, she, McCullers, is starting from this position that we are all essentially isolated from one another and that there are a million reasons why the things that separate us for me, when the book gets really interesting is in section two, that focuses mostly on Singer and his maybe role in the novel. And so we have to kind of work through that um, because she's getting at these bigger spiritual kinds of questions. And so to kind of, maybe impose order on the novel itself. Let's just go through, um, because we have two more weeks where we can, cause you know, you're right. Section three is the bulk of the novel. Um, and by the time you are done with this, with section three, and I'm sorry, you're exactly right. Um, and by the time you're done with section two, everything is going to change. Everything is going to shift. And you just have to get through that section um, to get to that space. So when we begin section two, <clears throat> the structure is the same in the sense that each chapter is focalized through one character. And we begin with Mick. And there's stuff going on with Mick. And I think if you can look at these chapters and try to, you're gonna find hints and find details that are going to accrue over the course of the novel that you can then see as action. And part of what McCullers is doing because she's a modernist is um, some experimentation here. And what I mean is, we're, most of us experience reading or are trained as readers to have rising action, a climax and falling action. And part of what she's trying to show is that that's a dramatized version of real life. <laughs> that for most of us, it is this daily, measuring your life out in coffee spoons, right? Go ahead. To me, she is using the communication, not only between hearing, the hearing impaired and normal people, but between normal people themselves. But my focus or my thing is the lack of ability of singer to feel a part of the world. Hearing, I mean, I worked at Bill Wilkerson Hearing and Speech Center before I was married. So I have a lot of knowledge that I obtained through that. But when while I was still working at Bill Wilkerson, Dr. Michael Glasscock did the first cochlear implant. And the lady, the lady that received that was a pet, had been a patient, um, of Bill Wilkerson. I knew her real well. She used sign language. She read lips. But after Betty received the implant, she came in one day. She had to go through all this training. We were getting the audiologist trained at the same time that she had this implant to train her or train the patients. I mean, now there's been so many done at Vanderbilt that's unbelievable. But anyway, I remember Betty came up to me and I was a receptionist and I knew I had to focus on Betty and she, but she knew my job. So anyway, that's, you know, but anyway, this particular day, Betty was getting used to her implant and was beginning to be able to 
uh, use the implant to hear better and communicate better. Now, I'm not, the last time I saw or heard speech was not still a little bit of that of a hearing impaired person. It had improved, but what improved was her communicate or her connection with the world. And when she told me, you know, I was used to speaking loud and enunciating very, you know, with my lips and everything, because working there, you had to. And I remember she said, she put her hand on my arm and she said, Candy, you don't have to be so loud anymore. Yeah. yeah. And good. it was like, ah, me. That was wonderful. But I see because of the time frame of this book and the fact that we did not have as much available in medical terms for these people, they really lived isolated lives. If you go, if you can go to Vanderbilt and get the copy of Dr. the first director of Bill Wilkerson's book and his work with Dr. Wilkerson, the ENT, but that started the Hearing and Speech Center, you would understand more of this isolation and problems. He really, they really addressed it and they told all the things about not only speech, but the hearing and how much they did. You so, see there's programs for the children <clears throat> to attend in preschool so that they learn all this. And a lot of them nowadays do have the Coke implant. You'd be surprised. It's really interesting. So part of what you're bringing up is really interesting for this book because the way she sets up initially these two characters that don't speak and don't hear is that we naturally would go, well, of course they're isolated, right? Because of um, their condition. But you also have to remember, and this is going to be a big deal as you work your way through this section. Do you remember Singer, who develops this relationship with Anatopolis, he was, before that relationship, able to speak. He is able to speak. But he, the minute he got into that relationship with Anatopolis, he stopped speaking. And one of the things that's really super interesting, and we'll get there next week, um, when you get to the end of this section and see what happens, is that we never hear directly from Singer, except there are a couple little sound bites, right? There's some at the end of section two. Yes. When he writes his letter, yeah. To Anatopolis, we actually have him also trying to communicate. Well, even when he goes and meets, finds the three deaf people in the yes. hall, and they're all doing the sign language, and he, but he can't even communicate with them. Yes, very good. And so, so let me point something out to you or to the group. Singer probably had normal hearing at birth and through at least maybe four years old. But remember, you did not have the miracle drugs to cure ear infections. I have two cousins, one on each side of my family, who are older than I am. And they both lost hearing mm -hmm. because of normal childhood ear infections because they did not have Good old amoxicillin people. I mean, seriously. Oh, I know. And, and also, you did not have um, as many detect uh, testing for those. But a lot of children did lose their hearing and could speak. My cousin, if you did not know her, one of them, you didn't know that she was hearing impaired unless you knew her because her speech was so well developed. Now, today, both cousins have the Coke implants and do so much better. But my point is, Singer can speak. Right. He well, see, just stops on purpose. Because he can't hear himself. Well, I don't know. Now, that's a question see, for the reader. What 
What he spoke time? before though. He spoke I don't before that. Yeah, I was a child I was loses his hearing. That. Yeah. Once a child that has ear infections and loses its hearing, <clears throat> it loses its form of speech because it does not continue to develop. I I I hear everything you're saying. Yeah. What I'm suggesting in the book and how you can impose meaning on this experience with Singer is that it goes back to last week, the lover and the beloved. He commits his life to Anatopolis, period. And in some ways, he's just replicating the experience that everybody else is having in this book. It's just that nobody gets it. Yeah. In other words, he talks and try and thinks he can communicate with Anatopolis, but he can't. And what sort of draws people to him? And that's what we really have to think about, especially as we um, get into this section and we talk about the kind of the, the sort of religious echoes that appear in this section is that all of these people are drawn to him in part because he's very polite, yes? And will allow them to come in and he'll, you know, like he lets Blount stay there sometimes and he'll feed them. And then he develops kind of a relationship with Mick, but they're the ones who are coming to him. And they're projecting all of that onto him. Good. I thought it was great later in section two when he's like, all these people are yapping at me. I don't really get what they're yes. talking about. And we don't get that until he's trying to communicate that to Anatopolis. Yeah. And it's such a great scene, right? Yeah, Where he's I like, I don't know what these like, people okay, are doing. That makes sense. So part, you just said the exact right thing. And, and some of you were saying this earlier. So people project onto him what they want and what they need, yes? Mm -hmm. And then the bigger, really uncomfortable spiritual question is what? How do you do that to God? Yes, <laughs> yes, right? And that makes us really uncomfortable because then you step back and go, okay. I make God. Yes. Yes. And if so, what function does that serve? And that's when Blount, and we'll, we'll go through this more logically. That's when Blount for me becomes less annoying. Um, all right, let's look at <laughs> All right, hold on. You have, you have. Yeah. So in the Blount chapter at the beginning of section three, which is section two or three? Section two. two. Do section I keep three. saying three, y'all? Yeah. I'm so sorry. Se section two. We're in section two forever. Um, yeah is okay hold on Which chapter is section two it is four let's go to chapter four and let's work through this idea and then we'll go back and look at mick yeah um so he's going up to singer's room and you have that great moment where he and um, the doctor physically run into each other, but it means nothing, right? Except they're ships passing in the night who literally crash into each other. And, and then Blount's just like, what the heck? You know, who is that guy? And he's talking and Singer doesn't even know he's in the room, right? Yeah. It, which is indicative of everything that's going on with him. So watch, he gives Singer his backstory. So let's talk about that for a minute because he tells you, you know, comes from this really underprivileged background and all of a sudden he discovers this. He says, I'm on page 151 in my book. It's not yours. So it's chapter four, right? Mm -hmm. 
So go in, like for me, it's two pages maybe, or three maybe for yours. Look for this. My first belief was Jesus. There was this fellow working in the same shed with me. He had a tabernacle and preached every night. I went and listened and I got this faith. My mind was on Jesus all day long. In my spare time, I studied the Bible and prayed. Then one night I took a hammer and laid my hand on the table. I was angry and I drove the nail all the way through. My hand was nailed to the table and I looked at it and the fingers fluttered and turned blue. I wanted to be an evangelist. I, I meant to travel around the country preaching and holding revivals. In the meantime, I moved around from one place to another. And then he says, I began to read. It was like being born a second time. Just us who know can understand what it means. We have opened our eyes and have seen. We're like people from way off yonder somewhere. And then it says, Singer agreed with him. Okay, that's just, that's just, that's well, Jake's thinking, thing. right, that he's doing this. But let's take this apart for a second. Here's a guy who grows up in terrible poverty his life changes when it, I, I think he can make 30 cents or something. I'm not getting that exactly right. But yeah, 30 cents a day um, stringing tobacco. And he leaves his family. Nobody cares that he's gone. And he's quite young. And then he gets this change where he has this belief in Jesus and he wants to be an evangelist and his <clears throat> life is full of that and he reads and he studies the Bible all the time. But then he begins to read other things and he says he's born again. Interesting, right? Mm -hmm. And then on the top of the next I didn't get the whole thing about him driving the nail through his hand. Okay, what's what's that about? Yeah, I don't know. That's like what Jesus I'm asking. Said. Jesus. So clearly it's an image, yes, of crucifixion. Okay, I mean. But part of what McCullers is doing, and you have to really pay attention, is she keeps sprinkling in all of these um religious and christian references i mean um, i got that you know obviously but i didn't see the point of it i don't know if there is a point except that we know jake is a really tightly wired guy yeah <laughs> and where is his frustration coming from Mo he's angry and he's frustrated what is he angry and frustrated by Every time, <laughs> the happy people that don't have things, people he, that don't listen to him when he tries yes. to encourage them. Yes, but then we have to go back. What frustrates right. him? Advantages the poor. Yes. So this, you get into this space with Jake where. He feels like he's part of the group of people who have not, who are taken advantage of and exploited by capitalism. Yes, so by those evangelist, evangelist for those people. Yes. So what happens is this conviction he has about. Christ is replaced by this because when he gets religion the first time for him that's this fundamental truth it's not about saved to many people not, it's not, it's not me alone but there are only a very very few of us knowledgeable folks like me yes and 
he wants to be an evangelist. And this moment where he gets really frustrated and really jittery and then slams the um, nail through his hand is obviously an allusion to crucifixion, but your job is to go, what is he so frustrated by? And part of what McCullers is constantly trying to show is, so religion, and she deals with both Christianity and Jewishness in this novel. Singer is a Jew. And she's going, here it is, right? There it is. It's way up here. And it's this, the ultimate goal. But what is it exactly? And why is this sense of communion so difficult for so many people? And what she's showing is that more often than not, for the people in this book, their real life experience supersedes this idea of hope, this idea of some kind of spiritual restoration. And with Jake, what becomes clear to him as he reads, and he doesn't read in the way that Copeland reads on this very philosophical level. What he fundamentally feels is that he, along with so many people, are exploited by management, capitalism, whatever you want to call the it, man. the man. And, and remember, this is the 30s, right? So, so th this is depression. And so he realizes that is the truth of his life and his experience. And then he wants to evangelize about that but nobody is listening, even the people who should be listening. And then he does that great moment where he says, here's the thing, Jesus would have been one of us, right? Where he goes, um, Jesus would have been one of the little guys and he and I would have gotten along great and we would have talked to each other and, so this is on 158 in my book. Take Jesus. He was one of us. He knew when he said it is harder for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. He damn well meant just what he said. But look what the church has done to Jesus during the last 2000 years. What they have made of him. How they have turned every word he spoke for their own vile ends. Jesus would be framed and in jail if he was living today. Jesus would be only would be one who really knows. Me and Jesus would sit across the table and I would look at him and he would look at me and we both know that the other knew. Me and Jesus and Karl Marx would sit at a table. <laughs> so then you get you open up all of these cans of worms because Jake tells you he's not a communist. He maybe sort of is, but he refuses to join the Communist Party. But he also <laughs> thinks that Karl Marx is, the, is one of the people who get it. And generally, people get to this part and shut down. Because why? What, because they can't see Jesus and Karl Marx together? Yes. And when, I mean, look at popular culture war right now. Using words still in 2023, like communists, Karl Marx. What's the other one that they use? Uh, uh, socialist which nobody ever understands correctly, fascist, yes. So one of the things that McCuller is kind of teasing out that is really 
off-putting for a lot of people. And think about how people would have felt about this in the 30s as we're moving so clearly towards World War II, is that when, because he says, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't even really like Russia. And it, unless you step back and go, what is happening here? It's this weird thing because most people don't really read Marx. They know only a popular interpretation of Marx. Marx starts his work in the middle of the 19th century when the industrial revolution is kicking up in England. He doesn't know anything about global economics. But what Marx notices when industrialization comes to the Western world is, oh my gosh, this is awesome. But now there's this clear separation of classes. There are people who have and people who have not. Well, weren't those there before the Industrial Revolution though? I mean, not in the so same funny. way. Yeah. He talks about that too. It's not the same in terms of what he recognized as the suffering of, because serfs were on some level the responsibility of oh, I see. the land owner. And so this, the people who have and the people who have not, he thinks is not a good condition. So he introduces this concept of communism, which technically, not technically, literally meant that we, would, we could all live together in a beneficent way, loving each other, doing the best up that we could, you know, whatever your skills are, that we, there'd be mutual respect and kindness and love. He was a sociological philosopher. Yes. Who believed that the that the evil structure would fall away. Yes. And and we would all live together. Yes. In, in, in this state of communism. But we've never had a Marxist state ever because communism turns into totalitarianism the way it's been the way it has played out historically, that you that immediately when you have a group rise up, then you still have someone totally in charge, a party in charge, and then the people who have not. And so there's all this confusion and Blount's the one who's like, here's the real truth. The world is hard and there are people who are suffering and exploited every day and in real life Jesus would be on my side right because it's part of the gospel of Jesus right the, of Christ aren't these I mean as I'm listening to you these are Steinbeck's philosophers yes in spades yes I mean, it's, it's just a hundred percent and remember Steinbeck's writing at the same time. And remember, we America's in a depression where that state of not having is more widespread, but also much darker, much more um, virulent in certain places and economic conditions. And so, yeah. With communism. Yeah, 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 a hundred percent. And so part of what he's sort of, he is not able to separate his own experience of suffering from this wider, broader ability to communicate and commune with other people. So he ends up an evangelist with no listeners. And then that section ends, which is so sad, where he has this, he, he walks out and he sees this scripture written on a wall. 
And the scripture is, ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth. What is it? Talk about it. <laughs> so what, what is that? Is this a passage that's familiar to you all? It's Ezekiel. You will eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of the princes of the earth as if they were rams and lambs, goats and bulls, all of them um, fattened animals. So it's, so it's not like a widely known passage <laughs> for most people. But when Jake sees it, he's like, a kindred spirit. Yes, <laughs> that because what Jake ends up saying is, here's my testimony, action, period, action. Do you remember that? We have to act. That's he because he, he tries to start his own movement, and that's their motto, yeah. I guess. Yeah. And then as soon as he starts the group, what happens? Nobody does. Everybody starts stealing the money yeah. to buy stupid stuff, like you know, coats and you know, hats, <laughs> right? And so here's a guy who fundamentally believes he understands an essential truth. He's not able to see how his truth isn't that far removed from the gospel of Christ, but he also can't get anybody to listen. And when he sees that scripture at the end, he writes this note going, whoever wrote this, meet me here tomorrow. And then he just waits and waits and nobody shows up so he's constantly frustrated and constantly tell, and he tells Singer all of this without any under, and he says, you get it. You're the only one. That's what he says about Singer. You're the only one. So then as a reader, you're left in this position of, is Singer a Christ figure or not? He's at the center of this town and all of these people who are isolated or suffering or sad or whatever kind of revolve around him. And they each come to him and tell him their truth and their problems. And they all think they have a special relationship with him, but somehow this relationship with him gives them something. Is he a Christ figure? Mm -hmm. yeah. Why? Why not? Because you're right. He's not. Why not? It seems like more of a portal of some, you know, that I'm trying to figure it out. But... You were there, but they want him to be, but he's not. He's just more of a sounding he's not board. transcendent. Good. Yeah. Yes, good. What else? <laughs> yes. Or a blank slate or whatever. And you're right. What all of these people seem to be searching for is whatever understanding we think God is. But they're projecting all of that onto someone who, A, doesn't really understand any of what they are saying, not because of his impairment, but because he thinks they're all kooks, <laughs> which they may be. But each of them sort of elevates him and sort of sets him up on this pedestal. You think he realizes that? I think we're going to get at least some explanation for that, but I don't want to do that yet because that's the end of part two. I've read all. Well, you're the only one. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. Not, not very many people have. So we are going to get kind of an explanation. So then it 
So a lot of times, and McCullers does this on purpose, she keeps throwing these nuggets in like Christ figure, Christ figure, Christ yeah. figure. And we all just go, oh yeah, he's a Christ figure. But y'all step back. They want him to be, but he's not. Well, and they are making God. Yeah. They're making him into something. They're finding something that they, they're projecting and they're just finding him to be agreeable to their projection, right? Yes. I mean, he's, he doesn't know what's going on, but they yeah. think. Yes. They think they're finally, getting Finally, I found someone who agrees with me. Yes. And then it gets into this bigger kind of spiritual, scary question when you think of, you know, is that what we do? That we make God into what we need individually, right? And then you go, well, I don't know if that's a bad thing, right? Is it? Is it Donovan? Is it bad? <laughs> well, I, yeah. I mean, I think the the quest of our quest is to continue to move into the the mystery of God. Yes. That is again, holy is something other. Yes. You know, no. you know, how do we give up ourselves for whatever? We yes. Have that I don't, it's gotta be. It's so hard. Right? Because, um, I, like, 100%, you are right. What McCullers, and I think McCullers as a person and as a writer wants that too, but doesn't see how regular human beings get past themselves, like give up themselves and that's even lee smith said that right she would go every week to church and get saved in a different church every week and but her ultimate fear was because you know lee smith right we've done we've done some lee smith lee smith said if i totally relinquish myself who will i be You see what I mean? Which is a really, do you get that? If, if you totally give up yourself, then who will you be? But I think that's where faith comes in. Yes. P.S. Super hard. Yes. yes. Absolutely. And part of what she's seeing and kind of looking at is each of these people seem to be searching and they find something in Singer, but none of them is giving up themselves. They're just projecting their themselves onto him. Does that make just, sense? Yeah. Yes. And then the, and there's something, there's solace in that, but there's not communion, right? There's nothing in it for Singer. Nothing in it for him at all. And they're not even thinking on that level because their assumption is he and I are in this together, right? He's the only one who gets any of this. And he even has that same experience. Well, now I'm kind of working my way backwards. You know, you watch Dr. Copeland at the beginning of this section too, who, well, we know he has tuberculosis, yes? And that there's a good chance he's dying. But what is his gospel? But he articulates it. A parent should. Okay, yes. You mean he tries to teach this to his children? Yeah, and, and, and at the party, the yes. Paul Marks one, and he preaches it like somebody preaching from a pulpit. So, what ends up happening Particularly is for Negroes. <laughs> well, he okay. So let's see if we can articulate what Copeland's gospel is. What he, like Jake, recognizes is the dehumanization and exploitation of his race. 
And he tells you as a younger man, he would get so angry because he kind of had, he's another evangelical, right? In the sense that he, as a doctor, he goes from place to place and tries to tell people the <clears throat> truth. And again, not having any real impact because P.S. these people are sick and poor and they are dehumanized in this community. And so now he's this old man and he says he too used to get so mad, remember, and he would feel evil. But now he's an old man who is dying. He names one of his children Karl Marx, right? <laughs> and none of that takes either. And then you have this wonderful scene at the beginning of this section where Portia comes to him and says, we are having a family reunion. And grandpa, it'll be the first time we've all been together and forever. And then we realize he hasn't even seen half of his children in forever because what, what broke this family apart in the first place Why? That is correct. Why'd she leave? He hit her. That's right. And she takes the children, goes to live with the grandpa, and he's on his own to, to, to figure out his own truth. And then what happens when he agrees to go to the reunion and he shows up and he explains, well, the narrator tells us that grandpa wants to read the Bible. And so Portia reads, he says, you know, let's, um, this is his wife's um, father. Right? Correct. Yeah, because yeah, he tells you his parents died. Yeah. And so on, I'm on 145 and Grandpa says, the word of God sure do mean a lot in a time of trouble. And Portia says, well, which part do you want to read? And he says, it all the book of the Holy Lord, just any place your eye fall on will do. So Portia reads the book of Luke. And the whole time, Copeland is popping his knuckles, which P.S., I cannot stand. <laughs> and he says, you know, I've always just really wondered, this is grandpa, about that whole Jesus raising the dead and curing the sick. Many a day when I be plowing or working, I done thought and reasoned about the time when Jesus is going to descend again to this earth. Because I done always wanted it so much, it seemed to me like it will be while I'm living. I done studied about it many a time. In this here, the way I done planned it, I reason I will get to stand before Jesus with all my children and grandchildren and great grandchildren and kin folks and friends. And I say to him, Jesus Christ, us is all sad colored peoples. And then he will place his holy hand upon our heads and straight away, uh, we will be white as cotton. Ew. Yeah. <laughs> that the plan and reasoning that's been in my heart a many and a many and a many a time. That's a weird part. And that sets a couple on. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then on the one hand, what he's talking about is being, you know, purified, saved, redeemed, whatever. Yes, I have redemption. I have redemption is becoming white. <laughs> yeah. What do you think that means? Why doesn't he say white as snow? That's what we always said in the Baptist church. 
Why does he say white as cotton? So y'all yeah. so, look, in their experience, who, who, who looks like they're getting saved? White people. And the suffering and exploitation of the black people in the South for a long time after Rice was connected to cotton. And so it's this beautiful sort of speech by the grandpa where he kind of says, I cannot wait to see the Lord. I'm gonna take my children and my grandchildren and blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to say, Lord, we are tired, Black people. And then there's that part of you, the educated part that goes, oh, this is so good because, you know, the meek shall inherit the earth. But he doesn't say that. For him, even though he can't articulate it, salvation is connected to being white. And so the high voices, I see God's face. It's a large white man's face. Yes. With a white beard and blue eyes. Yes. You know, so they can't even... And so part of what happens in every single circumstance with these people is that, and I love the way Donovan articulated it, is that they their own experience of suffering supersedes any sense of something greater beyond them. And for Carson McCullers, it haunted her that she felt that way too in her life. So that what way? she was this girl who looked like a boy who didn't fit into the South, whose mother there's that great scene. Do you remember this scene at the beginning of part two where um, it's baby and baby's mothers, like one of those. Pageant moms. Okay, I wasn't going to say it just in case. <laughs> yes, she's a pageant mom. Well, that's what Carson McCullers mother was. And so she always felt that she couldn't get past herself and her own suffering to get to what she knew she wanted what which for her was god but she couldn't she couldn't get there and it haunted her her entire life um and so what she's kind of doing with singer is suggesting because we can't get beyond ourselves even when we're in a fellowship of other Christians or religious people, if you look around, how many of you are on really the same page? Or how many of you are? And I've done this myself. I mean, I've looked people right in the eye and they'll say, this is what God says about this. And I'll go, not my God. <laughs> what? Yeah, I, I think reading this, and one of the things that makes this book hard to me is that the, all these four people are desperately yes. miserable and alone. And yes. You go back to what it must have been like for Carson McCullers to grow up in this in this crummy little Georgia town. And of course, the rest of her life, she can't wait to get the hell out of there. Correct. But, but you understand that her misery in that, not just adolescence, but the fact that she doesn't fit in here and the place must have felt evil. Yes, 100%. Yeah. That is exactly right. And, and the, he puts people like Copeland into an impossible position. Correct. There's no way he can get out of this. And there's no way that, that Jack, is, no one is ever going to listen to him. Nope. And no way that Biff can do anything but all. And okay, so but even when she did get out, she didn't find acceptance, right? So she she's such a strange little bird in the sense that 
she moved toward acceptance and always screwed herself up. That's, that's, that's what this book is about. Yes. Yes, exactly. So she would do things like, like everybody, when this book came out, people were like, oh, look at her. She's the prodigy. She's going to be a big deal. So then she got funded to go to this famous writer's colony. And she was the kind of person where, so you know Catherine Ann Porter, the Southern writer. I don't know if you know her, but she's also yummy. When she, when Carson McCullers got to that writer's colony, she just developed this huge crush on Catherine Ann Porter. And a lot of um, Carson McCullers' relationships were with, with women were mostly, mostly one-sided. And she just started following her around and like throwing herself at Catherine Ann Porter in this like supplicant kind of way where she was like, oh my God, I worship you. And Catherine Ann Porter just wanted her killed. <laughs> <laughs> and was literally going around to, and so it's like that kept happening to her because she kept trying to figure out how am I going to make this marriage work how am I going to be a real writer and a real group of writers and every time she would she would move towards that she would realize it wasn't working for her. And a lot of times it really was, as you say, it like this book, she was just projecting herself out there in a million ways, hoping at some point something would stick or she would find a way past all of that. And she never did. Is there, is there a sense of being accepted as a, who you are created? I yes. Mean, it's part of it to me. And, and then, if, if, if you merely want God to accept you as who you are, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's what this is all about. Yes. Which is shallow, shallow can be, but. You know, there are anxious all, lives. yes, yes, and there, and you know, Jake says this too. You know, first he fell in love with with the gospel and with Jesus, and then once he started getting in church, he realized that was a business too, right? And each of these people are little evangelicals trying just out there yelling 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 can i say how much i like the idea of pounding a nail through mm -hmm. and, and then going in depth in that and go i worked out at the con farm yeah that transition is like can we go back to the <laughs> exactly. but it also, <laughs> like, what was that about? But it also <laughs> follows and um susan brought this up Last week or the week before, I can't remember, but but it, that follows Mick. That scene where Mick hurts herself is just pounding herself, pounding herself physically, which is a very they're all beyond anxious, right? They're so frustrated and well, comfortable in their own skins. For sure. No, and what she's kind of saying is, "Are you yeah. right?" And then how does that happen? And what are we actually moving towards? And I think Donovan's right. Ultimately, is it, is it possible for us to ever move towards the real mystery of God by giving ourselves up? It's awfully scary. It's also really hard. It's good. It's a good book. You just gotta push. Damn. Have you have you read the Heaven and Earth grocery store? No, I've never even heard of Somebody that. Somebody tell well, me about that. Right. Twenty twenty three. Oh no. It's, it's by the same guy that wrote the. Uh, American. Yeah, the guy who wrote the color of water. The Brown. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And. You should read it. That's oh, what sorry. pulled me away. That's what I've been working on. And 
he's dealing with these same issues entirely differently. But uh, so you so, should so, should we do that one? So, uh, oh, we'll need to do. Oh, I'll totally read that. I no, I hadn't even heard of it. We should do that. Yeah, Let's, we can do that. But first, we have to get through this. What's the book about John Brown that he did about the uh, the the uh, bird? The, oh, something first. Yeah. Lord God bird. Yeah. The, yeah, the Lord God bird. Yeah. All right. So next week we finish part two, and then the last week we can zoom through three and four because there will be hope. You have to trust. You have to trust Sue. <laughs> Who are the hopeful characters in the book? That's... There's only three. There's no four. No, there was a four. The other thing you can do is watch the movie. Now, no movie does a good, great book but justice, no, justice, justice right. right. But you, if, if you don't want to look, look, look at the movie, Alan Arkin. Alan Arkin. Got, yeah. Got but there's no part as singer. There's, there's uh, four it's, it's good. Oh, that's then I'm sure you're right. You're right. We'll do three, section three. You can tell I have no idea. Part one, part two, part three. All right, y'all. All right. There is hope. You have to try. Okay. All right, you guys. Let's get out there and evangelize a little bit. I'm going to be out of town next week, so I hope I can Zoom this before, uh, Zoom next week before I come in and follow it. There you go. Huh? Yeah, what? not Zoom. I won't be able to Zoom when I'm in Florida. Florida. I'll be playing in a golf so, and then we're going to go. Oh, that's and now she's finishing that and moving to this hill that she takes, I think, forever. But she's reacting beautifully to the targeting. It must be because that must be. Yes, anyway, that's the same thing. But she'll probably, I think, they said she'll probably have to She'll probably have to take the other. And what they're hoping is yeah. uh, they're projecting yeah. that when yeah. she goes into remission, so what they're hoping is that by two years, because there's a lot of money going into the study of this one, that um, yeah. doing really and seems but he, but it's not the same but it seems to work it seems to work it's what non smokers want but you know both of those things yeah boy yeah the world is different now exactly but i'm concerned about all right i'm thinking about you Yes, I'm listening. I swear. The people that they were uh, dealing with, to the extent they had become.